Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming here today, for repeating those who are repeating from the session celebrated yesterday. Welcome all of you who is uh, your first time today here. As you know, today we have the second session of the seminar on deep journalism, which is a cycle of conferences and conversations that we have brought from Media Lab in collaboration with uh, the journalist and writer Marta Peirano to investigate or talk about uh, other practices or other journalism practices that usually, since they come from other disciplines or other interdisciplinary places where it's difficult to identify the sources or the processes, the research processes in which they are involved, they are not considered as journalism. Um, our guests today, as the ones we had yesterday, are not journalists, but we think that what they do is journalism, and we think that what they what they do is a vanguard journalism, something that will change the discipline uh, and the way we understand it in the future years. Yesterday we saw that the stories that we told are always uh, come from the methods and the tools that we use to tell them. And in that sense, there are stories that can only be told in a certain way. The stories that we will see today are stories that can be only be told from different perspectives, uh, stories which complexity can only be covered by uh, a series of evidences, registries, processes that usually are linked to very different agents and times. Usually they are slow, violent stories where suspects are, uh, let's say, invisible uh, colossus like um, global warming and the alteration of, of clim climate patterns and the chaos of facts only implies that uh, in, we need to cover times and stratas that are very different. In that multiplicity, we want to talk about uh, multiscolarity, and we want to talk about a multi-temporary investigation in terms of journalism to ask ourselves which other practices are possible to practice that are that conjugate uh, methodologies uh, reserved to visual arts or archaeology or cinema, and they can be interested in issues what we usually define as actuality, to a call to appeal other agents that more or less most of the times are more than human. In this second session of the journalism, we will have Alfredo Puente, who is uh, over there, and we'll have on Susan Chupli, whose practices uh, render a world of indivisibility, of, of rebel, and, and serial contact nations. Right now, we live in a moment in which the technological escalation, in which computation is changing the way we experience uh, space and time. Somehow, our times, our history, our geo geology are collapsing in a world in which microscopic and macro uh, macroscopic are interdependent and in which human stories relate with temporalities and agencies that sometimes defy the current uh, journalist uh, methods. These metabolisms of information request somehow new processes, new methods and new tools as we were seeing, uh, we saw yesterday, to which with which we can build stories, stories uh, like the ones we are, we are going to see today, that talk about energy, uh, crimes against humanity, in which legal voids and climate change become a complex to cover the negligence of companies and agencies. Susan Shupley is a researcher and documentalist. She's also an artist uh, based on in United Kingdom. His, her work covers uh, the material witness concept, which covers co co concepts like war and other, other concepts like um, environmental disasters or those that are related to uh, climate change. She's director of research uh, architecture Research Center in Goldsmith, and she's the founder of Forensic Architecture. On the other hand, we have Alfredo Puente, who is art historian and main commissioner of uh, Cerezales Antonino Vicinia in Leon, uh, in which um, he's, uh, he's a commissioner projects in this institution with a great deal of different collectives and agents. His work is both theoret theoretical and practical, covers aspects that cover the relationship between different strata, different layers that cover from the cultural aspect, the ecological aspect, and the geological aspect, and the complexity between uh, among the three of these. Uh, 
with him uh, we have Pablo Pino too who is member of the member of the future of the Central Mountain of Leon Natalia Castro who is a re manager of the reserve in Valle Luna and Stray Alfaro who is a reserver of uh, the herbal herbalism of the Universal and we also have Manuel Correa who, who has been in, incorporated recently who is uh, on a Colombian artist and whose work also covers uh, uh, the reconstruction post conflict in contemporary societies we'll start by a presentation we'll start by Susan then we will go with Alfredo and the whole team from Terezales and then we will have a small talk in which we want to open uh, that speech to all of you from the very beginning so uh, once again thank you for coming and let's start thank you Susan Ah. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, apologies that this presentation will be heavy on the English language. As you'll uh, soon come to realize, uh, I do a lot of the voiceover narration of my videos. And so um, you will be hearing myself both live, but also in the kind of clips. So um, I, I appreciate your patience on that front. Um, first, just lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for the invitation and to uh, participate with Alfredo and your, and the, uh, your team. And I'm really looking forward to the, to the research and the practices that you've been developing. So I think it'll be a really wonderful afternoon. and. Um, we are also really privileged to have uh, Christo and Adam and Marta set the stage yesterday. Um, so I do hope the materials that I um, unfold will try and uh, forge some connections, albeit um, perhaps not at the level of the kind of computational intensity and rigor, but in terms of some of the kind of politics that might uh, connect our various practices in the context in which we work. Um, I wanted to begin not by delving into the Material Witness, which is a book project that sort of brought together a lot of the work that I had done in relationship to tracking media um, entities and objects through um, largely uh, legal, legal spheres, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in particular. But to jump to the very end of this book, um, and now my, yeah, so if I go to my next slide. At the, in the closing argument of the book, and the book is really structured as a trial, but in the closing arguments, I um, introduce the idea of earth evidence. And by the end of this project, I'm really starting to look at the ways in, in, ways in which environmental systems themselves have become a form of media. And, um, and so the ways in which they are understood also by the, say, by the climate scientists and the earth scientists that study ecological events. They also treat these entities as forms of media. So atmospheric scientists that are measuring, say, uh, particulate matter in the air will talk about clouds as noise, and they talk about their research as trying to extract a kind of signal from the noise of these atmospheric events. So, in um, moving, say, a little bit from my engagement with kind of legal practitioners to climate scientists, um, I very quickly uh, realized that we actually share a lot of uh, similarities in terms of language, uh, in terms of an interest in 
media and technological systems. And the image here is, this is a detail of an ice core, and this is really where I want to start today because um, I'm going to present a series of short clips from various documentary projects. And then the second half of my presentation, I really want to focus on um, a recent um, series of works around the weaponization of cold that are, are a collaboration with forensic architecture. But I'd like to situate that within a larger research framework that I've been working on now for many years around learning from ICE, which is really an, an, an investigation into the ways in which um, ICE, this very ordinary but also extremely extraordinary material, mediates all kinds of practices and particular knowledge practices from scientists to indigenous communities, um, from the worlds of culture to the worlds of um, glaciology and say physics. But um, ice cores are crucial when we think about earth evidence because in the world of climate science, an ice core is unequivocally the highest resolution data set that we have of climactic histories and in we can actually see in this ice core this is, an ice core is a volumetric um, you know it's a volumetric extrusion from the ice sheets typically Antarctica and Greenland is where the major coring projects happen and we can see these layers and these are compressed layers of air and the air inside an ice core is the actual air from hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of years ago. It's very different, even though it's called a data proxy, it's very different from a tree ring. So a tree ring can give us some sense of what the precipitation was in the past, but with the ice core, rec with the records that are archived in ice, we have the actual ma material from another time and that is in the form of you know, methane gas, CO2, that's compressed in the ice. And scientists um, can measure that and therefore make the kinds of claims that uh, are integral to the reports of the IPCC, for example. And so my project really began by um, engaging with the Canadian Ice Core Archive. So in Canada, we have an Ice Core archive um, with cores from, largely from the Canadian high Arctic. So it's a much smaller col collection. But here, for example, we see um, this, is a, this is a half of an ice core. And you can see the ways in which they start very quickly, um, get marked up, cut up, etc. Samples are sent to labs all over the world. And one of the most important things about when you're working on an ice core is you always have to have these arrows drawn on the core itself, because the one thing you can absolutely never do is turn a core upside down, because you'd be inverting the temporal record radically, maybe for you know 100,000 years. Um, so my project, Learning from Mice, begins in the Canadian Ice Core Archive. And I'm going to take you into that archive now. And I just want to also uh, make the point that in my practice as an artist, sound has become perhaps one of the most crucial elements of the, of the work because it, it's with sound that I really try and denaturalize these images because I'm often in environmental systems and I'm not, or in environments and, and geographies, cryospheric environments, I'm not a nature documentarian. I'm trying to produce, I guess, content, uh, develop forms of storytelling, if you will, um, but in order to denaturalize some of these images that might seem quite familiar to us in some sense, I've really relied on the acoustic register to do some of that conceptual labor for me. Um, we're, we're, I'm going to, I'll show you some clips from the Ice Core um, film, and that's actually going to screen here in a few weeks. But, and it's just from random, random places in the actual documentary. So let me begin now. Thank you. 
That's a fairly long sequence, and this, we are, it'll, what I do want to do is now move directly into the ice core archive, but in that sort of short little clip that I show you, that, that's a very manual ice coring operation, and you can, and, you know, this is taking place in Nunavut in the Canadian high, well, Canadian high Arctic, and it's not the kind of large-scale operations that you would find in Greenland, for example, and in, in Antarctica. Um, so it's a very different kind of ice coring kind of practice. And Allison, who's in the video, we will now enter into the archive where we will see Allison um, working with the cores that have been now sent to the University of Alberta um, and are in this new facility. And we will see the same person now at working in the actual uh, archive where these cores are stored and preserved. Entering in through this airlock, basically. The Canadian Ice Core Archive, now at the University of Alberta, shelters this unique collection of historic ice. from Mount Logan in the Yukon, as well as from the Arctic Archipelago, including the Penny Ice Cap on Baffin Island, the Prince of Wales Ice Field and Agassiz Ice Cap both on Ellesmere Island, and the Devon Ice Cap on Devon Island are all preserved within these cylindrical tubes. I'd like to play one more clip from this um, video. It's, a, it's about an hour long, so it takes us into many different kinds of contexts. And actually, Manuel, remember when you were helping me with the color correction? Yeah, so it's great that you actually get to see it. Um, I want to play this um, clip here because this is really where I started to think about the production of artificial cold, which will then take me to the cold cases that I'm going to sort of um, emphasize or close with today, because this is this sort of moment where I really started to think about the fact that cold, even though we understand it as a kind of ambient environmental condition, is actually um, not only, of course, is it artificially produced, but it can be used um, to modulate and control entities. And um, it's a sort of moment in the Canadian Ice Core archive that eventually takes me to like the contemporary work on the cold cases that I'm doing now. So I'd like to play this clip. Climate controlled environments are energy intensive. From the conditioning of air, the refrigeration that feeds cold supply chains, to the thermostatic extremes that safeguard precious samples of ice. The production of artificial cold requires a vast infrastructure of compressors, coolants, coils, fans, and most importantly, fuel.
The processing of data and storage of information too requires intensive cooling systems. While cold has a natural history, artificial cold had to be invented. Although the survival of ice cores is also reliant upon cold, sustaining our icy infrastructures globally has come at the considerable cost of warming our planet. Since 2017, the UNESCO Ice Memory Project has been extracting cores from endangered glaciers, especially from subalpine and tropical mountain regions, and transporting them to Antarctica, where they are preserved in the natural server farms of the pole. A vast data set of vanishing information now stored in the material memories of ice. As a teenager, I saw the snowy peak of Kilimanjaro every day from our home in Liumungu, Tanzania. But today, the mountain's glaciers have almost entirely disappeared and will soon only exist within their distant sanctuary in the Antarctic. In 2009, Martin Sharp submitted evidence of global warming to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Not in the form of graphs or images, but a field recording of the Belcher Glacier on Devon Island in Nunavut, an acoustic lament to the accelerated melting of Arctic ice. Thing that you've obviously you could tune into in terms of the voiceover narration um, throughout the, the ice core film we really are always moving between a conception of ice as as media and I'm talking about the server farms of the poles and that's really where the sort of the, the, the sort of data sets that are ice cores are being kind of stored in these open air uh, refrigeration systems if you will um, I'm I'd like to play a couple of short clips and then um, just to give you a sense of how I'm trying to develop an audio-visual kind of language for trying to in some way also suggest the kind of internal life worlds of ice. And um, I, for this project called Arctic Archipelago, which was um, uh, it's, a, it's a film that it ha has a, a commissioned a musician to develop a musical score, so there's no language. There's no, like, no one ex kind of explaining. And the, the reason for that was when I was in the, um, uh, I was on a, a sailboat working as crew for a couple of weeks with a glaciologist, and we were circumnavigating Yan Maya, which is the biggest um, island in the Svalbard Arctic Archipelago. But, you're in these extraordinary kinds of environments that I would almost like characterize as, as mythic, you know, ice, water, um, clouds and atmosphere. There's very little to see. Certainly you can't really see the kind of politics that are completely saturating those spaces. In that space, I was very aware of the fact that the Trident nuclear fleet and also the Russian sort of subs are moving under the Arctic ice. It's also a space where Svalsat, which is Europe's largest um, satellite telecommunication system, is, is, is situated. So we know the electric magnetic spectrum is completely saturated with um, information with uh, pre presumably also military intelligence gathering. 
um, et cetera, et cetera. There's you know, vast ecological changes taking place. But when you're in an environment like that, there's sometimes very little to see within the sort of visual field that can alert us to the kinds of politics that are operating in a space like that, because these are not spaces where people live. Um, and so in working with uh, Mohammed Safa in developing the kind of music, we tried to start to work together to, between the kind of acoustic register and the visual to somehow suggest that something else is going on to kind of produce a, perhaps a psychological or more affective experiential kind of space. Um, I'll play literally uh, a minute of this and just to give you some sense of this other project where I didn't really have a specific storyline to tell. ending um, actually and then finally um, the last sort of contextual clip I, I would like to share is one um, from a very recent and ongoing project uh, called listening to ice where I'm working with a group of scientists as well as mountain villagers in the Zanskar region of Ladakh in northern India in the Himalayas um, that was is part of a British council um, support a research project. So this project is ongoing and we're trying to develop an acoustic methodology to monitor um, glacial dynamics and change, in particular in relationship to uh, the, the fact that one of the kind of, not only are um, mountain communities completely reliant on glaciers for the source of water and thus agriculture and food production, but also we now, accelerated um, melting is also producing these flood burst events that can sort of wipe out a whole community. So um, this project, was, we were in uh, the Himalayas last October, um, just sort of starting to uh, install sensors, et cetera, et cetera. So this needs to be a very um, long-term kind of project. And I can say a little bit more perhaps in the, in the Q&A about how acoustics, which is a very, um, not a very common way that you would actually measure um, mass balance changes of a glacier. It's a very, we could call it pioneering kind of science, but um, it's been, it's really interesting and it's been used in uh, Svalbard in particular in um, maritime environments has never been used in, in glacial kind of lakes. So this is also an experiment. And, and at the same time we, that we were doing the scientific kind of work, we we're also working with a local NGO from Lay and engaging with um, other kinds of uh, communities and environmentalists, all in relationship to the sort of um, the idea of listening to ice, listening to stories, listening to intergenerational stories of the changing kind of nature of mountains and glaciers, etc. Um, so I was in a recent uh, webinar in uh, Kathmandu, and they asked me to produce a one-minute like uh, excerpt of this project. So. Um, I'll just play it just to give you a sense of the different things that we were doing um, and it has some music on it but it's the ultimately I'm trying to edit a documentary so it would be very different from this but this just gives you a little bit of a sense of the different kind of um, things that we did while we were uh, there.
Um, so the, I've set the context, and I would, I'd like to use my last sort of, what, 15, 20 minutes to delve into the cold cases. And um, what's become important in my thinking is really this movement away from the sort of legal um, context to uh, thinking much more, not about law, but about rights. And like, legal forums don't really, they're, they're, they're not able to actually produce justice. Just, the law can pass judgment, it can um, ask an oil and gas corporate uh, company to provide, to pay compensatory damages. Justice is not something achieved through legal mechanisms, and so, the work that I'm thinking about and working on now is much more um, interested and engaged with questions of rights and what might be, and when we're thinking about rights and under the kind of contemporary conditions of climate change and affected communities and the sort of um, histories of colonialism and structural kind of racism that need to be a part of that story, then we have to also think and ask ourselves what might a climactic sense of justice be in those um, and so this is really where I'm trying with the kind of content, with the kind of current work to really think about like cold rights within a kind of warming world. And that, that, that is really some way where material witness and that sort of legal engagement has really taken me to a different place, which is, as I said, much more focused about rights. And we could also question that in and of itself as well, of course. Um, let me... So the cold cases are, there are a series of cases where I'm looking at uh, various, as I said, questions and queries in relationship to, to um, cold and uh, what might be, uh, what are the harms, but also mechanisms for uh, perhaps right, for pr uh, producing kind of cold claims, if you will. Um, but I wanted to, uh, present three cases that deal, and they're all based in North America, and you probably can tell I spent a lot of my life in Canada. I'm Swiss Canadian, but um, Canada has been the kind of context for a lot of my um, work, and the cold cases begin in Canada, and then they move to Standing Rock and then the U.S.-Mexico border. Three cases all deal with the weaponization of cold, and um, we will really see the ways in which cold as an ambient environmental condition is used as a clandestine practice of policing in Canada with extreme harms inflicted against indigenous peoples to the ways in which cold eventually becomes part of regulatory frameworks in detention in the United States and is really used um, in a much more, let's say, um, institutional kind of way. But the ways in which the modulation, regulation, um, and the ways in which like temperature starts to, it, like the ways in which temperature ultimately becomes a register of violence or changes in temperature and that the temperature in effect is the violation. Um, just, just for the sake of time, I'm going to, jump ahead. Um, part of this project, I've also made a kind of timeline, and the reason, one of the reasons I, I it's a bit hard to see, because I realize I use a lot of dark sort of images. This part of the timeline, it'll, uh, when I exhibit this work, I, can, I have a lot of the research materials that are on, uh, are available to people, et cetera, but I also really wanted to underscore the pattern, because um, the ways in which, um, the use of cold as a kind of weapon, of course it continues today in Europe with migrants that are attempting to move from um, Italy into France and crossing the Alps and, and perishing from hypothermia, etc., or across the, the Turkish-Iraqi border. So um, I really tried with this timeline to, to really highlight the ways in which we're talking about patterns of abuse. Um, but the first two clips start with the case of freezing deaths in Canada. So it's the most historic case. And just to say, in working with forensic architecture, it was trying to 
I wanted and needed to establish a kind of visual language because I'm dealing with grievous bodily harms, the death of people. Um, I wasn't working directly with the families of the deceased. And so with um, forensic architecture, it was really to think about like first, how do we actually think about the representation of cold, but how, and also the, the fact like what kind of visual materials or representations would be somehow ethically um, relevant to the situation. So I, I'm just going to begin, actually. And as I, I'm just playing clips once again. In June 2000... Oops, sorry. Let me start that one again. In June 2003, Russell Sabo, chief of the Saskatoon Police Service, admits that an officer was disciplined in 1976 for abandoning a woman who was eight months pregnant on the outskirts of the city. During the night, three people, all First Nations, were taken into custody by Constable Ken King and driven to an isolated area. There they were dropped off and forced to walk back in cold nighttime temperatures. King reportedly drove them outside the city limits as punishment for having liquor in a place other than a dwelling, rather than lay charges. Paperwork would have necessitated bringing the three people into police facilities where they would have spent the remainder of the night. King was eventually charged with discreditable conduct and neglect of duty charges he repudiated. On October 15th, Constable King was fined $200. This clandestine practice is known as taking someone on a starlight tour, a shadow system of racist policing in Canada aimed at evading the justice system, one that would repeat itself over decades to come. The following cases map a pattern of abuse in which temperature, in particular cold, would come to play a strategic role in the violence perpetrated against Indigenous bodies. As each case unfolds, we track the journey taken through the city using historic temperature data, which is synced along the route. The point of interception by police and subsequent abandonment of those taken into custody usually in remote areas of the city, is also highlighted. As daytime temperatures drop under the cover of darkness, wind chill and precipitation would combine with often deadly consequences. The timeline we created expands and contracts, focusing on minute details leading up to the period when people were apprehended by police, threatened, abused, and eventually deserted, or even left to die. It also maps the denial and delay of institutional responses to the practice of starlight tours, in which years of indifference would rarely see any form of justice done. Cold cases, which are, in effect, climate crimes. Okay, oops, sorry, yeah. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump to the end. So over the course of the, the piece, there's like 10 different cases that each of which has its kind of own sort of unique map. We can't, unfortunately, the maps are very dark. You can't really see them, but there is a map where we see all of the um, routes taken by the police. And this was just a consequence of me doing research going through witness statements, et cetera, and, doing, and also I've been in all of those cities, so really trying to determine the exact look, um, journeys that the, that the police would have taken when they took somebody into custody and then abandoned them. Um, but I'll just jump to the very end of the video. 
In May 2015, sorry. <laughs> okay. In May 2015, allegations dating back more than a decade were brought forward against eight provincial police officers in Val d'Or, Quebec, accused of sexual abuse and abandonment of Indigenous women. There are several Algonquin communities in the vicinity. All officers remained on active duty until a Radio-Canada program, Anquiette, made the women's claims public. According to victims, officers would routinely pick up women who appeared to be intoxicated, drive them out of town, and leave them to walk home alone in the cold. Some alleged that they were physically assaulted or made to perform sex acts. Cindy Rupert House, a 44-year-old woman from the Picogan community, was last seen on April 23, 2014, at the hospital in Val d'Or. Her parents have accused the Sûreté du Québec of failing to take her disappearance seriously. Police, who only reopened Rupert House's case following Radio-Canada's investigative report, are now saying they're treating her case as a murder investigation. The eight officers implicated were eventually put on leave or transferred to administrative duty. In June 2016, 50 volunteers searched the forest for her body, but didn't find anything. Cindy's disappearance led to the discovery that many Indigenous women in Val d'Or have alleged abuse by the Sûreté du Québec. At a news conference, Sûreté du Québec Captain Guy Lapointe said that of the 14 allegations, two involved sexual misconduct, as well as the sexual assault allegation against a ninth officer who is since deceased. Lapointe stressed that some of the allegations date back 10 years and aren't a reflection of the police force today. When racialized people, especially First Nations, come into the custodial care of authorities, police, prisons, and schools, harm, abuse, and violence is a frequent outcome. Admission to freezing deaths and abandonment as an informal operation of policing has been vigorously denied, and disciplinary action and accountability remains infrequent and is at best significantly delayed. Yet the pattern and practice of Starlight Tours has unfolded across cities and rural communities in Canada for decades. When authorities were forced to confront the outcomes of inquiries and commissions, denial and indifference on the part of those implicated was the norm. Dropping temperatures and environmental conditions became lethal weapons and tools of force for managing and abusing racialized people. Yet findings of exposure and hypothermia in autopsy reports could not prove that the weather was used deliberately on the part of those authorities who took people into their custody. Nor indeed would any coroner's inquest establish the actual cause of death, namely structural racism and settler colonialism. No death certificate will ever disclose the real reasons that Neil Stonechild, Frank Joseph Paul, Lloyd Joseph Dusty Horn, Rodney Nastis, and Lawrence Kim Wagner perished, nor the hundreds of others who have disappeared or died through willful neglect and abandonment. can understand. I realize, to me, it seems quite echoey, but uh, I hope you could understand. I, I'll just, um, and I played a little bit more there to really kind of um, sort of lay out the argument as well. Um, it's a very different in 2016. We have a lot of footage, uh, obviously, from the No Dapo movement. And so um, this case was in some way the sort of more classic kind of forensic architecture um, modeling. So, um, so a little bit of um, footage and, 
And then I'll play a second clip. On November 18th, the Morton County Sheriff of North Dakota released a cold weather warning. It was specifically directed towards water protectors and other protesters involved in the No Dapple movement. I will die for my people and my land. I don't know about you, but I will die for my people and my land and my younger generation. Look at all you cowards over there. So just, ooh, well, um, just to say that, so the Morton County Sheriff issues a, a cold weather warning. So now the authorities, they're aware of the role of temperature. They're aware that temperature could even be certainly very harmful, possibly even kind of deadly. They issue that warning specifically towards water protesters. But what happens is they, they go ahead anyway, and they begin a 12-hour assault. And in particular, they, use, they fire water hoses at protesters. And water under sub-zero, in, in, in temperatures below zero, um, you know, sprayed onto people in their clothing, emit, causes very, very detrimental kind of effects. So even if the water itself wasn't ice cold, uh, the air temperature in combination with soaked clothing is produces a very kind of dangerous situations. And so it, that evening, 300 people were afflicted with hypothermia. And this is the, um, this is the model that uh, we produced to try and locate all of the different sort of activities on this one very chaotic kind of evening. Using photogrammetry software, we were able to calibrate the drone footage obtained by Unicorn Riot. This allowed us to build a precise model of the area around the blockade and locate people, vehicles, and objects within the site. An LRAD sound cannon had also been fired throughout the day in efforts to push back water protectors attempting to clear the blockade. Stationed on the north side of the bridge of Highway 1806, we can see a row of armed riot police standing behind two meter tall razor wire. Positioned among them are four military tactical vehicles, one armored police car, a Len Colbert cat, and one mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicle, or MRAP. Further back, we can see two fire department trucks, which likely delivered the water hose to the police, as well as mobile floodlights used to illuminate the scene. You shot a pregnant woman, my wife. The position of the MRAP and floodlights allowed us to photo match and situate numerous videos captured from the ground and air. This enabled us to map the indiscriminate use of what is referred to as less lethal weaponry on the night of the 20th of November, 2016. We mapped a total of 78 cameras. I'm gonna go ahead because I'm pretty much out of time, but I wanted to give you a sense of like uh, how we were trying to let me just play. Um, so trying, you know, uh, what is very kind of like um, classic as the forensic architecture move is, is to try and produce legibility um, in a space that's very kind of chaotic, but in, in, in our case really trying to prove the kind of systematic use of the water hose against um, protesters because the police in, in claim that they were actually trying to put out the fires that the water protesters had lit to stay warm. Um, our modeling actually uh, basically disputes that um, point on the part of authorities. This case, like so many others, is still ongoing and legal challenges are moving extremely kind of slowly. Um, and I mean, at the end, we can see the 
at the end, the uh, Unicorn Raya provided all this footage, but you really start to see the ways in which icicles are also building up on the kind of razor wire itself. Um, so as I said, this was a case with 300 people um, afflicted with hypothermia, but because of the blockade, access to the hospitals also was extremely kind of hampered by the um, event. And just um, the case had been stalled for more than. In closing, I just want to signal the last case, which was the one that I talked about. That was the ice, what is called ice box detention along the U.S.-Mexico kind of border, and. What we've tried to do in this, um, with the modeling of this particular case, Testim is to, and let me go into the, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a bit. Um, yes, using uh, CCTV footage, which uh, was made public by a judge in a specific, in one legal case, we got a kind of glimpse inside um, one of these holding facilities. And so what we were trying to do was understand the dynamic interaction or we could say behavior of temperature in a holding cell. So detainees have jackets removed because anything with sleeves is considered a suicide threat. It's a concrete floor. They're given these sort of mylar blankets. And so what we tried to do was model all of the different th thermal properties of the detention. Uh, center, and so it's a very kind of basic model, and there's still m much work to be done on the part of forensic architecture, I mean, on the part of forensic architecture, or, or if I want to take this project forward, to really understand how temperature operates across many different kind of material kinds of surfaces. And so, it, with this, um, their temporary holding let me cells. just pause it. With From this, their temporary holding cell. Sorry, with this, I'm just going to because I find it's a bit echoey in the videos themselves, but with this project, um, what I was, as I said, what I was trying to do over the three cases look, was trying to understand the ways in which temperature in the Canadian cases, the more historical cases, although they go up to 2015, um, is used uh, as a, a clandestinely. Like the police use it, but it's not part of any sort of official kind of narrative, and it's 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 completely disputed and refused, even though there's unequivocal proof that this actually happened. Uh, in the case of uh, detention along the U.S.-Mexico border, many of the witnesses talk about how the guards would threaten to turn down the temperature and use the temperature as punishment and deterrence. So. That third case really looks at the ways in which um, temperature is understood as a kind of part, a tactic and tool of kind of policing and is used uh, to punish uh, bodies in effect. And of course, over all of these three cases, we always see the kind of ways in which temperature is inflicting harm largely on bodies and subjects, racialized bodies and subjects, in fact. and so. Um, ultimately, the, the three cases really try to make the argument that temperature itself in these cases becomes a crime. And I'm going to leave my presentation there. So thank you very much. Yeah. Bueno, pues, eh, gracias, Susan. Eh, thank you, Susan. What an inspiring presentation. Honestly, yesterday we had Adam and Christo, which were also just as inspiring. And it is a pleasure for me to be here. I would like to extend, to extend my gratitude to the organizers. My name is Alfredo Puente. And today I'm going to do one of the hardest things that could be asked from me. Surely something that journalists have, which is a very, very high capacities when it comes to be short and brief, which I certainly don't have. I come from a very small institution in the region of León, and if I had to present my association um, in a very brave manner, I would need years to do so. so 
please excuse my lack of uh, synthesis, but I will try to be as fast as possible. I've never really reflected upon what we do in our organization when it comes to journalism. I'm not really sure about it, and I don't want to be an intruder in a profession that I highly respect, which is not my profession. I remember um, having a conversation, and I said that if there's um, any convergence with journalism, it would be a sort of strange journalism, um, strange as in ancient Greek. So if, just for you to know that uh, seno journalism, seno periodismo, is a term that, um, that was created almost randomly, almost out of uh, luck. We like to walk on and off the path, and this is what we're going to do today. I have people with me who are very prominent voices in the region. We have Natalia Castro from the Amania y Luna Biosphere Association, and for a few weeks now she is responsible for the World Network of Biosphere Reserves for High Mountain Terrains. We have um, someone from the defense of the Cantabrian mountains, mountains and Pablo Pino from the Central Leonese Mountain Platforms. They are uh, speaks people, spokespeople for different human and non-human processes that take place in this territory, as well as processes that reach um, a level of importance that is quite remarkable. We are trying to understand our territory not only as something that is dwelt, but also as a medium, as an environment, and also as media. We have very low um, population density in our region, 2.9 people uh, per square kilometer versus around 70 people per square kilometers in in average. So we are trying to find the images that we are missing to have a good understanding of this territory. I'm going to ask for some imagination from all of us. There's uh, a lot of uh, exploitation in the region, especially within the primary sector. There is a lot of land for livestock. That was uh, before very large water reservoirs um, were created. There used to be more pastures, more pasture land in the area. In the region, the river water temperature and the population uh, flows change radically in the 70s with the construction of these dams, which um, cease to be irrigation reservoirs to become or to shift to power generation. There are also mines for almost all minerals you can imagine, gold, tungsten or wolfram for war machinery, coal for heating purposes, for heating um, houses in, in Spain and more specifically in Madrid and to provide um, heat supply to factories in the north of Spain. We are a team of 11 people, and this is a, an image that shows how we live in the region, in the area. These are demographic or, or, or um, thermal maps for energy consumption in Spain and energy consumption peaks. This was uh, an investigation carried out by a Spanish journal together with the Spanish Electricity Institute. However, these data are not available on the official website anymore. 
And I think it shows very clearly how um, what kind of relationship um, human beings have with the Terran, with, with the Earth. Julio Llamazares, a journalist from the area, um, usually says that the story of energy colonialism in northern Spain is yet to be written specifically for the region of León. We have identified that there are a number of world corporations that are exploiting, that are depleting the region. And when you see the large amount of corporations that are active in the area, you realize um, that there is a lot to be told. Yesterday, Christo was uh, speaking about how to operate when you have large data sets. But I am going to speak about how you operate when you have a large amount of, of time to show how we work in, in such a place. So that will be my starting point for today. I'm going to try and connect with uh, some images and videos from three different projects. I will be very brief about the two first projects, and I will um, be more specific about the third project, which is on the verge of being nothing. The three projects have different scales, different dimensions, with no journalistic um, pretensions, so to speak. And I would be unable to um, speak about them in detail in such a short time. But given their nature, I think these projects can help us to look for images with a different resolution, with a different sensitivity, which create a space for relationships between what is human and what is non-human. This seminar is part of a larger frame called sentient media, and I think this is very relevant. We could start by asking, how do you live here? What is life like in a rural area like ours? There's a very old word, which is um, neighborliness or a sense of neighborhood. I think that this is a, a word that is being uh, a protagonist in my presentation. So what is the sense of a neighborhood like in, in our region? It varies from one region to another, but we have identified a number of, of points, a number of elements. One of them is time. You need time and you need to stay focused and not get distracted in the current uh, society of media. You also need a methodology. I don't know if that is the right word because it's a scientific word, but let us use it. Let your methodologies not eliminate the possibility to remember, to forget, or to daydream, or to tell stories. This is very important because part of a neighborhood, when you're trying to create a network and a, a tissue between people in a region like mine, it's about documenting uh, stories also fictional stories. And I think this is very helpful to change a problem in a collective manner. I also think that biopolitics, as seen by Foucault, is really um, important here. I think one of the most um, recent and interesting findings are connected with, uh, with fiction, really. What you see on the screen is part of one of these projects. 
archive territory, territorio archivo, which we kicked off in, in 2012 with two filmmakers. It's still ongoing. We are using technologies that we sort of invented or thought of back at the time, and it has to do with human voice with an element of archive. To sum up, these two filmmakers I worked with together with the team in my foundation try to find spaces for listening, to create an environment of a conversation around those tables. And by creating an environment or creating a climate, what we mean, and this is something that I, that I reflected a lot on, um, Creating a climate means create, creating time. That's all you need, time. We realize that those private images were, in truth, a public asset. I'm, I don't think I, I will need help from Adam and Cristo uh, with their technologies. I think. Um, it was just about looking at those pictures and listening to those stories. Each picture, each image that is part of the archive is uh, part of a Creative Commons agreement between the curators and the individuals that you saw on the picture. I don't think I need to explain to you um, what um, implementing a Creative Commons uh, technology um, involves. I think, you know, it's a highly demanding task, and I think it has a lot to do with maximizing the time we dedicate to each other. There are currently around 3,000 active um, active uh, files in this archive. It's all on territorioarchivo.org. There was an exhibition stage. And during that um, exhibition stage, we tried to make all the layers of the project visible. We also included data uh, viewing materials, which were created by other investigators, like Alfredo Caloche, who is also here with us, to try to use other image categories to understand how the dissemination of those information layers take place, um, to what degree they lead to relationships between the territory, the images, and the places. I would like to show an example. I will not be, um, I will try to be uh, concise, but I want to show you a high resolution image of the oral memory of the region. Let's take a look, let's peek into this document. I would like to, uh, I would like you to be very attentive, pay a lot of attention to something that goes on in the background of this sound file. And where are you? We're on an apple tree um, harvesting apples. Yes, and we went all the way up to the tree using ladders, and there we went, pick up apples. There were uh, three or four that have been cut. But yes, she was in charge of this, and I, I was not in charge of that. I had my, I had a lot of work already, and so I didn't pick apples. But she liked it, and there was a lot of a lot of fruit um, back then, right? Yes, it was it was continuous. There was fruit all year through. But after the 
after the dam was constructed, the weather changed, and we have uh, much, uh, much less fruit currently, and that's 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 a thing. You can navigate these archives in different ways. You can use this page here. I think this one's very important. It shows the time each of my colleagues in my institution, Faida Chus and Ismael, dedicated to listening to all the cuts, all the audio files that were uh, submitted and which have contributed to creating this word map. Speaking of a map, there is one map here. This map allows you to geolocalize, to geolocate each of the images that are part of this project. Going back now to my presentation. We were talking about sentient media. Um, how are all those hours of listening, of learning materialized? I would like to point out um, one of those, one of the places where you can um, see the outcomes of the work, which is our archive. All the fields have been analyzed so that they can include the relationships that we learn from Territorio Archivo, the relationships between um, human and non-human things. And the tools you work with um, have an impact on the way you see the world. I think this was um, mentioned yesterday. Mention was made about how, uh, how you have to um, program computers if computers are going to dominate the world. So I think we could um, talk about uh, citizenship like a golem citizenship. It's about to finding new links with the planet with an, an, with an evolution that we need, we need to work on. What I'm going to show you, I don't know if you remember the audio file. Um, someone said that the trees had been cut. I'm not showing you what the person said in the audio file. What I'm showing now is that cutting trees or um, tending to animals, to livestock, is part of an activity like any other activities. It's about how we, what relationship we have with that place. It defines our roles and it defines all sorts of human, non-human associations. One individual can play more than one role in one day and doing one activity in an environment like the ones we work with. And that was important for us. Going back to what we were saying, it's very important to keep in mind that idea told by Tello, Tello about how the swamp changed everything. That perception, the swamp changed everything. It's something that we have heard in that kind of places with many different energies like coal, many cultures. Uh, and nowadays we still hear those stories, some of the uh, speeches about terraforming always appeal to the need of keeping natives outside the decision-making process, which is quite funny because keeping them outside uh, because of the hypothetical uh, global imperativity in such an urgent moment in terms of climate, we think just the opposite because we believe that it's never too late to listen to them I'm going to make uh, a step out of the way, as I said before, to those high-resolution voices that will be connecting to all these things. 
I'd like to give the floor to Pablo Pino from the uh, Central Leonese Mountain Platform because they are going they are conducting an information work which is quite solid uh, about this uh, development uh, model that will come after these swamps, these dams. It's a neighborhood collective and a non-visible network in terms of big data, which is quite in position of the use of renewable energies, but from a model which doesn't exclude the possibility of living together and populating their origin places, the original places. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Pablo Pino. I come uh, on behalf of the platform. Thanks of all. First of all, thank you to Cerezales for these minutes. I've, we never thought that something like this would come out from Leon, and our problem, which is not ours, it's, it, our problem is quite precise, quite specific, but can be extrapolated to many parts of the northern part of uh, Spain with, in terms of windmills, and in the southern part of Spain with uh, heat solar panels. We are a platform, uh, final platform. Everything starts when uh, uh, our current president enters as, as president of the of village and they find a report in a, in, a, in a shelf of a big electric company that wants to install windmills in the mountain, on the mountain. That report has been in a, in a, in a drawer for, for years. There's uh, 20 or 30 people in the, in the village and it's weird that not all of them are aware of that situation because the, the, mount, the mountains are common and that permission should be given by everyone. It's not valid that just one person makes the decision. They start, uh, she start, start speaking with other people, with other villages uh, nearby from their area, and they discover that they all have, each of them has a part of this, and they discover the real chart of what, what's going on. They have been working for several years. A uh, sales representative has been entering the population, uh, persuading people uh, of the good things of renewable energy that they will become rich, that they will earn a lot of money because uh, that it will compensate the lack of public money they receive of the population. So she starts making some research and eventually it turns out that that was a half truth. It's a lack of information to accept all those conditions without complaining. She starts a platform. Um, I tell her, well, I'm illustrator. If you want, if you want a, a paper, a, a poster, I can create one to inform people about this problem. And I started just with a poster, and here I am. Nowadays, we have developed a small communication group within all this because, in the end, what we are trying is informing people about the truth, the harsh truth for these people. We are trying to fight against lack of information from institutions and from companies and big and from big media uh, that eventually have found that climate change is uh, is getting to, to is, is getting us is, is reaching us they realize now not 50 years ago and everything has to be done quickly and that's the magic solution which is installing these uh, these windmills not only in our region we cover a specific region but you can move to the next slide if you want this is the small co region we are in this is uh, the north part of the region the central mountain of leon um, 
We live in a land that, uh, which is rich in biosphere, biosphere reserve, the richest one in the country, in the, in the world, as we could say. We just have this line uh, that covers what we cover, what we are, uh, what we cover, excuse me, as, uh, as I'd say, this same thing is happening in other parts of the area of Galicia, of Cabria, it's crazy. This is the small region in which we are. There are nine municipalities, and we have prepared this map to understand the context of what the implications for us of a project like this. Those nine municipalities have more than 10,000 people around. Probably there are even less living there, and the big cores of population are Robla in the south part, and a bit on the north, it's Poland de Gordon. They have lost over the last 25 years around half of their population. Right now, they are around 3,000 people around in, the, in, the, in those uh, places. We have schools, which are the blue icons, the available schools in the area, what it takes for children in the whole region moving, spending time every day to go to school, to move around, to be able to study. That's already a problem we have that hasn't been solved, and probably it won't be solved at the pace we are walking. In the south part, we have a couple of high schools, which is the darker blue icon. Everything flows in La Robla. You need to, to move there if you want. There's another icon when I talk to Alfredo. It's interesting. Is the icon of the orange one, the Euros icon. That's the ATMs, uh, the bank offices that are in the area. And not all of them work 24 hours per day. And they don't even work every day of the week. There are some. Well done. There are some that only work one day and on a specific timing. If we go to the next one, this is the, the approach of the extraction process of, of energy colonialism we had. We have a, a line from north to south, which is the high-speed train that doesn't even stop there, it just crosses by. And in the northern part, we have uh, all those crosses are the windmills. They want to install 51 windmills, probably with two windmills, all our area would be covered in terms of electricity for the whole year, but uh, they're going to install 51 windmills. Everything is connected in La Robla with the southern part that are all solar panels, those uh, red polygons are, are the, 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 the solar farms. There are uh, these black regions that are open air mines. That's the chart that about what happens, this, the pressure we have, we suffer as a population, as a land. And the northern part are biosphere uh, reserves that are directly attacked by uh, this problem we have now which is not proper to us. The whole province is suffering the same problem, and the whole north of Spain is suffering the same problem. And that's it. Thank you very much. I cannot tell that the session starts to begin to look like that saying pre journalism we mentioned in the title and there will be more during the debate i think that more things will come up i read i resume the, the path and connected to territory archivo in that coupling between scales that we always research uh, the, the re research this region the the changes in policy of water in which there are audios like the ones we heard before uh, and that led us to to this it's uh, this was developed also by the Ceresales team with the help of Bruno Marcos, who joined our team. And the structure, uh, the temporality of projects like these obviously are related to the fact of researching. Maybe that defines some sort of particular aesthetic or maybe counter aesthetic even, as I've heard in at some point, aesthetic that gets us away from those usual canons, uh, patterns in the exposition rooms. In this case, this is not the case. What I can tell you, it has meant to redefine many notions in terms of art and operating in a territory like this one from this perspective has never been included in any uh, syllabus. We have to 
develop the tools on the on the go. It would be very result test uh, of a white bucket. A part of the uh, phase in region there was uh, a part of, uh, of that research investigation that went through uh, showrooms. It was a six-year project, you can imagine, that uh, there were many uh, artists developing their creation. There were two museums uh, that were uh, related to this, that joined, uh, that one that joined at the end, and, and the, the space of the Cerezales Foundation also offered the space to, 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 to exhibit those. But I think we, don't, we shouldn't gather the projects like that. But for us, they are still alive in our everyday life. They are included in our perspective on how it, and what it means uh, inhabiting with uh, other humans and not humans in these kinds of places. And it comes from there. Territorio Archivo, as I said, has been ongoing for 10 years. Region 6, uh, we were about uh, to be four people, not, nothing more. In the case of the region, the region is a region, is, uh, is a, it gets branches of, uh, apart from uh, episodes told by um, neighbors, neighbors from Cerezales, and they tell us, they told us how they arrived to the village, something that already appeared in Territorio Archivo. That's how we knew that some of the families were were displaced uh, families because of the construction of those dams, which is the dam of Porma. Uh, in other places, you will know it as a dam, Juan Benet, because of the of the designer who created, and the, the, the dam of Riaño were con constructed during the, the change of uh, 19, 18th century to 19th century with uh, Costa Mañana, with Plan Gasset in 19th uh, zero two. That's not something uh, maybe you don't know, but in that period, in 1902, there was already a plan to create 170 dams and 65 great channels in, in Spain, so it could change as a, ch as a country. So the, the country became more of a dry, uh, turned from a dry land uh, cultivation to irrigated cultures. So at first, there was an economy based firstly on on dry land cultures. Then it was uh, replaced by uh, something that generated a lot of richness, which is all gist, hops, and and mind. And those cultures have been replaced by uh, transgenic corn. I think it's uh, eight, uh, 813 from Monsanto. These dams that you can see here, non-fiction with this uh, this um, panel before, but they created uh, a very picture of of the villages that were drowned by these um, dams. It was a uh, was a uh, fjords and many other mountain environment, which is the institutional picture of this. The actual situation is that the water in this dam is consumed uh, by humans, uh, also for irrigation, and the water from the dam of Riaño is uh, devoted to supply big dams in the southern, in the south, like uh, Almendra and Gricolayo, maybe you have heard about them, to generate hydroelectricity. Let's say that it's a uh, supra-territorial way, um, network, that uses rivers as, uh, as uh, on basins as pipes, so there there's always electricity produced. One of the main materials for this research, something that made uh, this uh, this field to show up, was the was a flight in 1965. Excuse me, 1956. I brought two captures, the B flight. It's available, this picture, in the Geographical National Geographical Institute. You couldn't see all the links, but for those who are not used, the flight B the, uh, is, is a flight that almost became a legend. Among other things, because uh, during Cold War, as Susan was uh, saying before, it suggested many things to me in the context of, of uh, dictatorship against American free world. It was our place to establish this collaboration between these two worlds, as we describe in these pictures. These pictures were taken by 
Airmap service between uh, 1956 and 57, and they were used both by the uh, American Army and the Spanish Army as a source of strategical information for Cold War, others to study the level of technological delay uh, suffered by the country. They have become uh, publicly available very recently ago, in 2011, basically when we arrived at Cerezales through this uh, photo gallery, I recommend you to take a look at it. And it's a source of, of data which is essential for us to see the big scale transformation that have occurred in the land, especially through the arrival of this uh, infrastructure. On the left-hand side, you have the Pantano, uh, the swamp of, of Riaño. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the, the dam of Porma, so you can see the scale. I'm going to stop in some of the works that were uh, occurred during this project that got us closer to those layers. I don't want to forget the context that brought us here today, the sentient part uh, that can be present in other technologies. The first of these is a work that uh, that was that is called Born in by Pablo Orduñez. It comes out of uh, from it comes from a conversation between Magua and the journalist Julio Yamarzares is someone born in Begamian, one of those villages that was drowned by the construction of the Dam of Porma. In his uh, uh, ID, his birthplace disappeared. This is very important. From that information, Mawa continues its, his research. He proves that inhabitants of, of drowned places uh, because of dams lose, uh, lost their uh, location of birth when they go to renew their ID. But since the archives of the villages uh, are displaced to other villages that are still outside the water, and their birthplace turns to be the first non-drowned place that is closer, so that requires a lot of energy. And so far, I know uh, in the field of ID, he achieved to get two birthplaces, which is Begamiar and Bonnier. For us, this information had to do with all the formula of slow violence, violence against the memory of our origin which is uh, which is raised willingly by the administration how the construction of uh, an aqua on a water landscape is built but a water that doesn't allow to see through its surface I mean that's a uh, landscape without resolution with no sensitivity Mawat achieved to dial to talk to the local population and in many cases it was taken from for granted as uh, as a collateral damage of the dam, and through this tool, I don't know if uh, if I could call it a administrative or juridic tool. I don't know how to classify without uh, any evidence, but uh, it, it achieves to deploy an action so those places that appeared in the American flight uh, come back to the IDs of those inhabitants with a record, with a video record, with navigations in the swamp, in the dam, Porma and Antona de Sao, another dam, where a, a neighbor reconstructed the, the city map uh, from a, a, a ship on the surface of the, of the dam. And, and this is a completely different um, work called No Life After Death. This is um, the outcome of a very intensive work at the Duero um, Water Confederation, an archive in the Confederation with a lot of uh, field work with the local population. This uh, project was able to locate the Allende Palace. The Allendes were a family of Basque uh, business people which were um, very much linked to the energy or energetic depletion of this area. This palace had been disassembled stone by stone and was placed in the in the village of Buron, 
right on the safety altitude, the safety level of the dam. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but dams have a safety level which is foreseen in case there is an earthquake or a tornado that might displace the water mass because under normal conditions, water would never reach those levels, those heights. As a matter of fact, nothing has happened. Water hasn't come close to these places, to these heights in over 30 years. So on the one hand, um, it would be very difficult to be specific um, about this. I mean, this involved um, working with the Spanish Parliament's archive. It would be very complex to explain this in detail, but this shows the link between the construction of the Limonet nuclear power plant, which failed, and the construction of the Riaño Dam as compensation for Iberduero, for the corporation, because the nuclear power plant was not constructed. So this also, um, this is also a witness of the relationship between the business people in the Basque Country and the depletion of this region in León. And it also goes to show how the houses on the on this height, um, 1,100 meters, are uh, trying to be evicted. The relevant um, institution is now trying to evict these people from their houses. This investigation project led to a number of uh, photographies uh, from almost a forensic approach. Um, and the artist uh, moved one of the arcades of the palace that I mentioned before to show how um, everything happened and to be very symbolic. The arcade was brought back to its uh, original position after the project ended. It would also be almost impossible to describe the amount of paperwork it took for us to have three different administrations, three different agencies work together. They had different competencies on the matter. Um, this would require um, its own conference, its own seminar. With this type of uh, investigations where you have so many people, so many disciplines working together, um, you run the risk that that collectivity, that that uh, joint work um, gets lost once the product, the project is finished. I would like to step off the path once again and give the floor to Esther, who is a member of the platform for the defense of the Cantabrian Mountains. They also work um, in this area, so we are going to move back to energy, to renewables, and to the role of dams. Hello, can you hear me? First, I would like to thank you for giving us the floor, for giving us the stage today. I am. I have been uh, fighting for the preservation of plants for 15 years, so I consider myself a botanist. I have now joined the platform for the defense of the Cantabrian Mountains, a group of technicians, of experts who are really engaged in the field of preservation, coming from different backgrounds. Um, botanics, uh, zoology, um, geology, etc. I would like to um, trace back to something my, my colleagues have mentioned. These slide shows uh, some data, but I just want you to know that they speak for themselves. We are going to focus on the area of the Cantabrian Mountains, but I would like to provide some context for this data. These data um, help us to understand the Spanish uh, climate transition plan, which was launched or started in 2021. I would like to tell you that the maximum energy peak has never reached the uh, level of uh, 50 gigawatts. Right now, we have 145. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. So there's an uh, over dimension when it comes to energy and what is being built 
with renewable energies. Not renewable energies, but renewable energy sources. What is renewable is not the energy, is the source. And they, um, the, the sources are not renewable. They would need uh, to be built differently. So how does this impact us who live in the Cantabrian mountains? Here is a map developed by the PDDC. The blue dots are the um, energy that is already installed, and in red you have uh, projects. And this is not finished. Consider we are talking about wind power. This map does not include solar power. There's a high concern when it comes to preservation of biodiversity. I would like to give a voice to those who cannot just def defend themselves, which are the animals and also plant species, which we tend to forget about. There's a very large campaign all of a sudden, it becomes, uh, it gets to the uh, journals, the fact that a company is creating jobs, is providing employment. I mean, we have a 200-meter windmill for each inhabitant of a village uh, with no other non-human being underneath it. I think this is, should be part of the news. This should also make the um, head titles. There are no women employed as technicians, something which should also reflect upon. I will now, I would now like to show you this plant on the upper right side of the screen. It says that this species is not jeopardized. However, there is scientific jeopardize which shows that it is. Even if a higher population has been found with more individuals, with which with more um, specimens, which is what the article really says, we realize that only 10 or 15 percent of them are going to reproduce. So the plant is having issues, and the area is so limited that any um, change or any construction could lead to its disappearance. So we should think about journalism, the role of journalism and deep journalism. The mountains between Bierzo and Galicia are jeopardized by a wind farm. This is an article wrote by Javier Guitán on the magazine seen cuerpos. Back at the time, we had no idea what was coming. This was about one single wind farm. However, right now, the communities, the local communities are being uh, threatened by 10 wind farms in a matter of one year. And lastly, I would like to tell you that the true challenge we have is to make the energy transition fair and just. And I would like to quote Susan Shupley, right or law in itself is not justice. A just transition to me should consider not only the inhabitants of that territory, in this case, they are our natives, but also the non-human beings that will be impacted. Let me tell you a story about this Girocarium uh, oppositifolium, this little plant here. The Spanish uh, Scientific Council called it no me ves. It's called don't call me. This is related to forget-me-nots, but this plant lost its uh, its related species a number of million years ago. We're going to install high power lines on top of the only specimens left of these species. We can talk about high-speed trains, we can talk about bats and animals. Plants are often neglected, but we are in the era of information. Why does this happen? There is no clear environmental policy determining where these um, energy infrastructures should or should not be installed. We need to 
fight for this. We need to think, where do we truly need that energy? It has to be decentralized, and the ones consuming the most should be the ones producing or generating the most energy, to be truly just. The problem is that these plants and these landscapes do not make money. They do not create money. They are free of charge as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I was listening to Susan um, about how to find high-resolution images. For us, an endless source is uh, mining, about to be nothing. On the verge of being nothing is the most recent uh, title, um, the most recent project. Its title um, derives from our conversations with locals when we ask them about livestock, cattle raising, mining, and farming. And they almost all said those are worlds of the, on the verge of being nothing. This project started in 2017 while the mining industry in Spain uh, was about to disappear. There was a formal plan with a, uh, um, a, an end point, which was 2018. The European Union had uh, uh, granted a moratorium of uh, 10 years, and the European Union was um, demanding that um, mines that were not profitable or sustainable either closed or uh, returned the funds that they have received, the European uh, funds. So they basically, they all uh, were shut down with no uh, plan for the future. The images that show those mines were always very much related to the figure of miners as heroes. This has been the case for around two centuries. And this project, on the verge of being nothing, uh, was a way of looking for new images, for uh, a new ways of uh, measuring what was happening in those places to find new figures. Because those heroes have been nothing but a burden that um, obliges us to look back in time and to dream of a bounty that will never return. So our reference was the soil, the terrain on those mountains. I was showing a picture with uh, some mountains before. They contain a high percentage of CO2 coming from the Cambrian period, thanks to uh, these little organisms that captured the CO2. We were trying to take a look at the rocks, at the veins. A lot of this project has taken place underground. And one of the important sources of information uh, that we used to understand what processes, what matters had to be considered in our um, quest to change perspective, there is one institution that I would like to mention called Theoden. Theoden is the City of Energy Foundation from Ponferrada, a project that was initiated by the national government and it was uh, conceived as a um, planet research project. With the new uh, government, it lost all of its financing, and the 400 people working there were cut to around 60. It was created with a very specific purpose, which was to work on atmosphere decarbonization processes both in Spain and around the world. This was a project, a uh, joint project with, other, with another seven countries that was very much focused on CO2 um, capture. The aim was to emulate the process that some organisms um, 
undertook. They created uh, calcareous shells to capture CO2, and this made it possible for life to emerge out of uh, the oceans. To try and trace those images with a different uh, sensitiveness, we have Irene Grau, Jorge Yeri, and Juan Lopez, three artists, and their work, our work, took place both underground and on the surface with labs that had been designed to capture CO2, like the one you have on screen, to liquidify it. And I think you haven't probably heard about this, to store it in the wells that um, had been created or the, the spaces, underground spaces that have been left behind by the mining industry. The idea was to um, have the adequate levels of water and pressure to imprison these uh, CO2 underground for millions of years, just like this happened in previous geological areas, so that the CO2 becomes limestone. We have um, similar projects in two of the largest uh, tunnels, uh, railway uh, tunnels in Europe, which um, are uh, placed beneath the Cantabrian mountains, more than 50 kilometers of tunnels, as well as other mining infrastructures like Nueva Julia, uh, Mine, Carrasconte, among others. We went back to the archives. We collected a great deal of information and materials, such as the um, uh, Segovia Military Academy's archive, which contains a lot of information of the Spanish activity in South America. And this archive showed how the Spanish crown had a preferential right upon any mineral that was found on the planet, and the first right was a military right. If that right was not exercised, then um, it was allowed to have different depletion of the mineral. So this was a sample that we included in our uh, project. During our investigation, we came into contact with the miners and their families. One of our uh, big helpers at the time was a group of workers uh, that had been employed by the Vitarino Alonso companies. He was the greatest uh, mining business owner in Spain. And there was a shift in the sensibility to different layers of soil. Here is a small area of the entire uh, hole that was left behind by the mine. They have created an organization to work with one of the uh, largest, highest resolution Im images that we have from the Carboniferous period. Everything you see on screen, and several people in the room can confirm this, is a huge picture of a forest with its different trees, the different species that uh, collapsed during that period and uh, gave place to these ores, these um, minerals. During our field visits, we haven't met a human being that has not perceived what this place really tells you. The nature of this area um, sort of forces you to link the present to the past. We tend to be very flashy when we talk about these territories, but the truth is that this uh, felling has been, this area um, has been um, rid of its uh, coal layers over time. And the truth is that this area continues to be in dispute, this uh, trench, so to speak. The economic, the financial resources that were supposed to re-naturalize this area as 
uh, demanded from the mining companies are not sufficient to even perform a study. So the European Union is demanding that these areas are renaturalized and become productive again, but not within 50 or 10 years' time, but in 16 months' time, 18 months' time. So this is where we see an entire new technological and media layer that comes into play. Among those technologies are, I don't know if you have heard of hydro seeding. It's a thick uh, substance that adheres to places where life is not possible in principle with GMO seeds to create pastures so that those who were working in the mines a few months ago with a, a blue coat um, put on a green coat and become farmers. A great deal of this land wants to be devoted to wind farms and there are rivers of acid uh, water because when you start removing those ore layers there are pirates and when in contact with water they turn acid so only extremophile organisms are viable and that's only possible through physical and chemical processes and we try to make uh, some living back to uh, to these areas through renaturalization processes and for me the most important thing is that they try to to, to cover this uh, picture by filling it with these arid materials which were initially removed to extract that coal. So we tried to erase the uh, previous, the prior activity and its memory. I cannot assure which kind of uh, journalism would be necessary uh, particularly to help uh, uh, journalism has the responsibility of helping us to make better decisions with everything that is related in society and one of one, uh, one of those situations is this one what I've tested is this um, this is a place that there's a lot of information coming from it uh, over 30, 30, 360 million years. I think I'm going to finish because I'm, we're on the limit. I'm going to show you some of the pictures from uh, works that were produced during this uh, project. This is a perfect montage from Jorge Girevi about the appearance of a fertilized mountain in different phases in this land. And as a consequence of that relationship of this uh, of extraction, it has three parts. And one of those was a collective work with people who were there in the working groups in the foundation, which was quite exhaustive. And through from the uh, archives of the geological study from Spain, and that working group did uh, what this group did was extracting information from more than nine tomes with volumes uh, in non-digitalized uh, volumes with all the dams and all the uh, debris that um, that were copied from one to the other and uh, from that work and using as a matter uh, 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 corn filament uh, recycled corn filament that came from the transgenic uh, that you heard before that came from the south part of the region they joined in this representation what it, it implies that alphabet inscribed in the in the landscape which is goes unnoticed by our eyes i'm going to make the final step of the way to the floor to natalia castro from this national network of with the world network of biosphere reserve reserves which represents at least 15 population 15 percent of the global population and its base is in a very small location in riello a small village in leon and over the last years uh, she has been operating from there thank you alfredo i come from behind the column so you can see me 
I don't come on behalf of the World Network and, and talk about some projects that we have on the land and as a biosphere, biosphere reserve and as a space for research for the sustainable development declared by the UNESCO. We try to develop small projects very related to our reality but can be extrapolated to other lands other with uh, similar features. In this case, it can be very extrapolated to that uh, biosphere reserves network because these uh, mountain lands in the end are very spe special places in terms of biodiversity richness, in terms of cultural richness, and also in terms of the ecosystemic system provided to the rest of the population. So note that the mountain land in the, in the world represent 25% of the emerged land and host 25% of the global population. Just to focus, um, since uh, we are a bit late, I wanted to tell you about a project which is called so We Are Water, Somos Agua, in which we are working in the analysis of how water stress affects uh, beehives. We, have the, we are lucky because uh, we can find wild hives in our land. That's a wild hive in which bees go there, uh, creating their swarm. And we don't work with those free range swarms, but our main uh, activities in the land is um, big culture. In, in frequency with Cerezales, uh, with a group called Centra Abierta, and especially with the APB, we have installed some sensors in our hives uh, from our um, hive apicultures, and how to, to prove that the water stress affects the well-being of the hive. And that affects the production of and the use that Oh, that the, the, the use humans do of, of the territory. What do we get from this? And what did I want to tell about uh, this, uh, this uh, that is related to this deep journalism? We do it hand in hand with some journalists, which are bees. Bees are acting as data collectors. They show us how uh, floration change, flowering changes. Some are some come early, some come later, and those uh, facts give us information, very valuable information about climate change and how it affects our land. This project has been working for two years. We have this uh, relationship with the group, with the apicultural group, beekeeper group. Uh, very, we create joint projects where many people join and many diverse agents and we foresee that uh, we keep obtaining data for at least four years and that has to do with uh, the time that Alfredo mentioned before that we have to devote to the, our projects and the time we need not only to obtain data that are reliable but also to define relationships that, uh, that allow data to Deep, go deep in the land, not only obtaining data that are interesting for us, but also that those data are interesting for the people in there and for the management of these spaces and the preservation of their biodiversity. I cannot tell you more about this project because it's quite long, it's ongoing, it's very beautiful. You can check it you know, on our website afterwards. But I want to present you, as Alfredo, well, since Alfredo said before, why don't you tell us, uh, why don't you come with me to Madrid and let's give a speech? Well, for me, that would be great. And at that moment, during that week, something happened, which is very was very interesting for me. I don't know if you know this. This is Sentinel-2. It's one of the satellites within the Copernicus program from the European Union, from the the space, uh, uh, from the European Space Agency, the program Copernicus, is defined itself as a, a look off from Europe to the rest of the world, and Sentinel-2 and the satellite, satellite Sentinel-2 are in charge of environment, of environment analysis of the Earth. It's quite interesting. There are two Sentinel-2, which every five days conduct a review of the whole Earth surface, forests, lakes, coast uh, water, islands, and they offer us many information in real time about what it, what's going on on the surface. 
On the 9th of February this year, there was a fire in a very small region within our um, Maña y Luna Biosphere Reserve. And just the next day, the Sentinel-2 passed over and could take this picture. This fire affected a region that is protected. It's a, it's a birch forest, one of the most known in, in, in the world. And there's a, a copper kelly endemic to this area, and it was very dangerous for that species. So this fire was dangerous for the area. So it's quite important, this picture, because it warns us from this uh, threat in the land, but it doesn't give any more information. Actually, uh, immediately, the, the, the people living in Tasgar and the fire fighters in the area were already fighting against fire, which wasn't dangerous just for these uh, uh, species. Um, from, so from the very beginning of the fire, there was a lot of people there trying to, to, to put off the fire. And after five days, another sentinel the next one, which offered another information. Now, with the fire off, it could analyze, uh, analyze the number of, of area, the surface that was burned, the, the, the perimeter, you can see the, the, the slopes which were affected for these, for technicians, for managers. It's an essential tool. It gives us a lot of information to analyze future situations and to recover spaces that may have been uh, degraded. What I want to tell from this, this is awesome, having all this information, because they are open source data, so everyone, uh, every user in Copernicus can see those data. The concern I have is that between these two pictures that I have showed you on the 10th of February, I didn't want to bring it, but uh, on social media the, of Copernicus, that which are at first are wonderful and they provide a lot of information uh, for all technicians, there was a link with the first picture in real time of the fire and information of affected surface. The source was a local journal from Leon. What information did they have? It has information that was mainly uh, sensationalist. They just wanted to clickbait people, so everything is new, everything is news. Uh, so that speed, uh, that need of speed and communication being essential, in, some, in many cases that contaminates, pollutes the reality of the data that we need to think about a future and how to build such future in areas as fragile as this one. And that's the thought I wanted to share with you today because at, at what point we must make a difference between speed and presence of media with uh, the relevant things for the lands, uh, the mountain lands. That's the kind of journalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you want, we can move to the debate. We are a bit late, but let's make the effort for this kind of project. So there's no problem. For the conversation that we'll hold now, after these uh, two magnificent presentations, I'd like a moment for to discuss, as I said before, from this moment, um, 
everything uh, is open to all of you. This is a word that I have stolen from from Alfredo. Everything is. This is a fill up, so we are all at the same level, so we can act at the same level. I've brought a little game that. Um, just to try to relate these uh, two practices we have seen today. And some people may think they are very similar, not may others may do things, but I think that there are some similar points for both of them, and I thought it was interesting to bring it to the light. Everyone, is anybody, does anybody have any question? Let's start, so let's give the microphone, so we'll start preparing this. about what she said before of how she uses the sound in the documentary to show something else. Like for example, I think it was with the eyes that you could see very little, but there was going on a lot of things there and you wanted to transmit that using sound that I guess that you created for that it seems. So the thing is how those people are appealed by that sound is like, if I see an image or say, I can say easily, Okay, I know what's going on there, but if it sound, it's like, okay, they want to make me feel scared, but I don't think if that's just their point, because I can't really see anything. Is that real? Should I feel actually that way? So the question is, does it work, actually? Does people believe in that thing is actually going on through sound? Hmm, that's an interesting question. It's not... Um and I guess it depends, the, the sound design and the engagement with sound varies quite dramatically, oh, I mean, it varies across the project. So every project involves field recordings, so lo working with lots of different kind of microphones um, that have the capacity to record different frequencies. And then also uh, oftentimes working with a composer then to perhaps uh, introduce certain kind of like sonic, um, let's say, signatures. So I've tried to create a sound for like extremophiles, for example. Um, so the role of sound, as a, you know, like in the ice core archive, I really wanted to refuse the idea of the, these ice cores as these mute sentinels or material witnesses, if you will, lying in wait for some sort of future out of which they would then be extracted from the archive and sort of worked on and really to try and in some way signal the kind of internal um, life of ice and the life worlds of ice that are sort of kind of um, crucial. But I also, to be perfectly honest, um, maybe just to answer quickly, there's a lot, of, a lot of visual practices that look at disappearing glaciers are very melancholic and that's the kind of move. And I, um, you know, that sometimes is in the projects, but I don't want to stay in the sort of melancholic kind of mode. And so in some way, um, use a lot of technical sounds and to really, in some way, underscore the technicity of, uh, and, and the technical practices that are part of the, certainly on, uh, they're part of the um, ways in which, say, the framework of glaciology or, or science would approach some of these kind of entities. Um, so sound has to do different things in different projects and that's why I said the Ar Arctic Archipelago project, it's a bit of an um, outlier in my practice because I had an opportunity to spend time with a glaciologist. I didn't have a specific story I wanted to tell and so it was a bit more of an experiment and that project is part of an installation. It needs another part, which is a footnote project, which I didn't show here, um, to try and in some way act as a foil in relationship to the pure kind of visual kind of auditory kind of um, dimension. So I guess, yes, if something has a certain kind of like, uh, no, I don't think the sound alone, if, even if the sound is it's foreboding, or you know, like disturbing. It's certainly not going to motivate uh, changes in like practices that could prevent the melting or disappearance of sort of um, kind of glaciers. It's more about. Uh, I'm always interested not in the, as I said, in you know, like how to denaturalize the image is a big part of my kind of has been a big part of my practice. 
and to write, to kind of refuse the idea of uh, things as, as purely naturally kind of given in whatever context they are, but always to understand their implicatedness and the, um, and maybe just to answer, I'm sorry, I'm always a rambler because I sort of think through questions and I, I love getting questions because they prompt me to think about things in a slightly different kind of way. And so I guess the, um, in that sense, it's like working with temperature is also, to me, has to be sort of similar, right? It's that we've all turned up and down the, our own thermometers in our, our homes and our flat. It's an activity we all have done, but somehow the project is in some way trying to also denaturalize that activity, like to, to, to create a moment of pause where we actually understand the signif potential significance of a, some seemingly ordinary kind of event, but in a different context could be quite um, hugely um, challenging, difficult. And so like this is the kind of like the way I'm asking sound or temperature to do some really important conceptual kind of work for me, but you know, whether that produces a transformative politics, that would be a whole other kind of, um, um, yeah, challenge that I don't think the work can really does uh, or have the, has the capacity to do. To be perfectly honest. Thank you, Susan. Um, maybe we can jump in. Well, we hablar en español. Perdonadme. I'm going to talk in Spanish now. We can jump from one image to another and also open the floor. I'm going to tell you about something now. About five days ago, I talked to Susan and Alfredo separately, and I asked them to to send Media Lab some images, some pictures of their practice, something that they believed was um, unique to their work. And they sent us five images separately. None of them knew about each other's pictures. And we've created this little game. This was done before I saw your presentations. We were trying to place images by both of them and correlate them with one term, one word that, that would describe their practices. And the first one we find is media. It's a term that does not have the same um, connotations when it's translated into Spanish. I think it has to do with understanding the media as something that goes beyond digital media, uh, communication media. There's someone who Abelardo also knows who told us that media was all the processes for information uh, processing and transmission and storage through matter. And I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Matter as not only uh, computer screens, but also ice cores um, or the surface that is left behind by a mine. So those uh, material witnesses which are able to record uh, information and also transmit it or convey it. So this might be a silly question, but um, by understanding or with a more open or broad understanding of media, which ones are the most extravagant media you've worked with? Ahora sí. La verdad es que la pregunta es es compleja, por lo menos en nuestro caso, pero no por It is a complex question, not just because one is uh, more extravagant than the others. Probably for many of us, the lifestyle in the cities have really taken us apart from many things that happen um, in the continuity of cities, um, outskirts or suburbs, uh, rural areas, and so on and so forth. Um, your ideas about the world change as you move away from, from cities. 
And if you are someone who is, like we are, really close to the primary sector, which is uh, a word of the 19th century, um, to say the truth, you might find things that you might consider as media, somehow they turn your brain upside down during on the verge of the of being nothing investigation stage i remember one of the largest uh, milk farms in the whole province of leon and that is that means very large i remember there was a robot a completely autonomous robot in a sort of a carousel layout that one was milking, I think it was 96 cows at the same time, while discriminating uh, milk for human uh, cons uh, consumption from milk that was um, infected or that had mastitis, mastitis. So I had never thought I would be speaking about uh, the um, cows and their udders um, as an arts uh, historian myself. But the robot was using sensors to uh, maximize performance and separate um, the milk. The idea of the media is not really one the people we talk to use because um, they are usually older people like the ones you saw on the screen. And I think they um, have a different conception of the world of transitions, of flows or fluxes. And something that really calls my attention is that those uh, what has gone through the bodies of those people is usually an, a static idea of the territory, of what it was, or of how it performed, or of how it was used. Those ideas are still there, and they are um, operating still. I could find more bizarre, more poetic examples, but the truth is that our reality uh, converges with that space. Sorry. Uh, is it working again? Okay, great. Uh, another interesting question. Um, I guess maybe you said what was the most, did you say extraordinary, unusual media? So, um, I mean, uh, on some level, I would have to say, yeah, probably recently, of course, would be Drangdrung Glacier, but I guess in terms of um, maybe when I was filming in Forschmark in Sweden and I uh, was filming in the, um, in the forest in the, around Forschmark. And Forschmark is the, is the power plant where the radioactive contaminants from Chernobyl were first detected. Uh, so obviously not in the former Soviet Union, but they set off the radiation detectors in the, um, in the power plant in Sweden. And um, so I was filming on the half-life of cesium, on the, basically the date of the half-life of cesium 137 in the forest environment in and around the power plant and using the Geiger counter to guide, like basically using the Geiger counter to measure radioactivity of lichens and mosses and so using that sort of radiological um, presence, if you will, also as a kind of like, if we could say like almost like a director of photography, like uh, suggesting that where um, and how the camera should actually and what the camera should sort of focus on. So in that sense, um, you know, the, I would, uh, moss and lichen, um, you know, they're a kind of sensate media, right? They're, they take the in, you know, nutrients from the air, they register, the things that are taken from the air are registered by moss and lichens, and we could, uh, so, you know, moss, lichens are sensing, and they're producing, if you will, a data later that then can be aggregated with other data layers, other environmental data. So I would say the sort of radioactive um, 
the latencies of this radioactive um, atmos uh, accident in the environment of Forshmark was probably the most sort of radical media that I've personally sort of collaborated with, if you will. Bueno, no sé si alguien más tiene alguna pregunta. Does anybody have a question? And we'll move from question to conversation and back to questions. Nadie? No one? Okay, let's move on. See if there are more questions later. The second topic that I found was interest to connect both your practices is field work. Understanding that it is a, a practice, that yours are practices that are truly located. Yesterday we were talking about practices that were synthetic um, or remote mostly. I was surprised to see that your practices do um, have an element of being in the field, working with communities, uh, being on the territory, like a users and a number, a group of people um, listening to uh, a glacier, and a number of people, in your case, um, drawing uh, a forgotten forest. So I would like to know about your practices and how they relate to other approaches in that mix or that um, halfway between more located practices, more personal on the field practices and more remote uh, tele-detection models. You can go. Ahora. Pues en nuestro caso, esa idea de. In our case, where you work is absolutely linked to an almost political statement, which I think highly resonates with, with us currently, which is. We are located there as a cultural institution, as a group of investigators, out of the desire to actually be there. At a time where the idea of the emptied, the despopulated uh, Spain is such a hot topic, at a time where there are so many cameras and so many people focusing on that discourse, I must say that that was not the case back then. Very few people were talking about despopulation. However, we wanted to be there versus all the people who told us, why don't you, why don't you are somewhere else? Why don't you settle somewhere else? And I think that's um, a lot to do with the idea of working with what you have um, on site. As I said before, you need time. You're not going to be in the media um, as an institution like ours. You're not going to really make it um, to newspapers. However, there are a lot of forces that are going to, to join you to, to feel appealed by your energy. And there's a, a place that we've um, tried to make into a collaboration um, space, we work with the idea of uh, a craft, something that has an, an energy, something that can be crafted into a tissue. How do you implement all those layers we've been looking at, um, you know, technologies and so on? It's a different dimension. You try to use um, the approach of importance and not immediacy. So, 
a lot of debates uh, come up. For example, what's happening, what's going on with the Omanian Luna Biosphere Reserve and the water stress in Colmenas, that has something that um, needed a, a space that needed um, a place to be um, raised, to, to really germinate. And it's taken some years. Um, there was a group of people who had no contact with uh, farming, and some of them started to think about how you could improve the relationship between beekeepers and beehives. It was a time where um, a business pressure for a, a producer of um, ecological honey was absolutely brutal versus the bee, the, the honey that was imported from other places of the world. Those people had to intervene directly on the, on the beehives. In a context with big uh, planetary movements, talking about a few dozens of beekeepers in a region in southern Europe might be an, an anecdote, might be, um, might seem like a small thing, but part of the tissue was supported by that fragility. So, converting uh, a spokesperson in a, an interface between us and technologies to use uh, to, to know what sensors could be used to uh, decrease the number of times the beekeepers had to go disturb the the bees to ascertain whether everything was okay or not if they have enough nutrients etc that really helped us in turn help them protect that fragile tissue. That tissue gives us uh, a, a very good degree of resolution about climate change, about uh, rain and precipitations, about flowering cycles, etc. So I would like to reiterate the fact that this exercise comes not from obligation, not from the current situation. It's something that is structural to a libidinal e economy. Fascinating response. Um, yeah, the question of fields, field work and the field is really um, an important one for me and something I've had a lot of conversations with different practitioners about like what constitutes the field in their work. Um, and just to say in a, in a recent sort of discussion with Heiko Goetzler, who's a, he's an ice sheet modeler. And uh, though, yes, I'm actually in the spaces in which I have stakes and working with communities and doing work on the ground, not in every instance, so some things are the field might actually have to be an archive, um, which would be, in some cases, was the, certainly the situation with the freezing death. So the field isn't always um, this kind of like this, the la a landscape, if you will. Um, so the field, and in Heiko's case, he goes, the field for him is a computational field. And he said that the, um, in some way, uh, like physical, scientists tend to really um, privilege uh, like being in the field and he, and then the critique of that kind of practice is that they're often it's so localized they don't have the big picture in mind right and the, the and the modelers which are so like a glaciologist or a physical scientist that's in the field that's say working to understand to measure and monitor a glacier is really trying to understand the past and so the, the kind of being in the field is a way in which they try and understand climactic histories where the modeler is producing future-oriented projections. The modeling is oriented towards the future, and the field for, that, for the modeler then is largely... It wouldn't be a seminar if there weren't <laughs> some small technical uh, issues along the way. Um, 
So, um, but I, ha I had a really nice conversation with um, Edward Brooks, who Shall we just use this one? <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, this seems okay. <laughs> um, sorry, what was I saying? Oh yes, I was having this conversation with Edward Brooks. He, Brooks? Um, he's a, he works at, at, this is at Oregon State University. I was um, filming in their, in, their, in their geochemistry lab and Ed is, so you know, now he's largely working with a team of um, chemists and they're doing the analysis, uh, like basically the analysis of greenhouse gases in ice, ice, in ice core samples. But Ed insists that all of his chemists in the lab spend time in the field. And uh, which seems like, like it's not necessary um, in some way to do the work, to be doing the kind of chemical analysis, but Ed said that, Every, all of his students and all of the scientists who work in this uh, geochemistry lab in the States need to spend time in Antarctica. They have to understand, he said, they need to understand the context out of which their materials that they work on emerge. How is something taken out of the ground? How is it measured? How is it, you know, like, how is it treated? How is, uh, what kind of recordings are made? And in the case of the Canadian context, you would also, which is not the case in Antarctica, because Antarctica isn't a place of indigenous ha habitation. In Canada, you would need, as a scientist, to get permission from local communities to actually work on the land. Even if you're extracting an ice sample, you're extracting, you need um, indigenous permission to actually do that activity. And so the scientist who's working in a lab in a city thousands of kilometers away from the field needs to have some intrinsic knowledge about what it means to um, extract or um, extract or work on materials in the sort of field. So I would, in some way, I think it's such a provocative kind of um, um, subject to kind of reflect upon. And I know that Bruno Latour wrote a lot about the relationship between the field and the laboratory. And I, I, but I do think asking that question like of everybody, what is the, what constitutes the field in your work, I think is a really interesting kind of a question. But I, just to reiterate, I really appreciated Ed's response because there's a way in which, um, which was different from the modeler because for Ed, it's absolutely essential to, spend, to understand how the materials of one's research actually um, make their way over many, many different kinds of procedures and, and uh, distances, etc., so that they might arrive in a lab somewhere in the world. And for me, that sort of contextual knowledge is what would be lost if, if one's uh, narrowly defined the kind of field as only operating in, in the very specific context of the kind of, let's say, discipline in which one is embedded. Yeah. yeah. It seems it's working now. Um, well, that is, I think, creo que has tocado. I think you have touched a subject that connects us to to the following concept, the following picture, which is understanding somehow the field, the field work or the land or the landscape as an archive. I think it has been obvious in both of your presentations. Archives and are an evidence through the amalgamation of different layers different layers that can come from different natures and it's there's an interesting question which is uh, that they act as complex systems the superposition of the different layers the, the different individuals that compose those archives which provides a perspective not given by the separate parts let's say that the archive is a uh, precedent uh, of let's say big data this conglomerate 
of, of information that as a, as a whole gives another information which didn't exist from the reading of each individual part. These pictures, the smaller ones, we have seen them in during the presentations, the, um, the ice cores, but I wanted to, to make a brief introduction of the larger pictures we have here, these, uh, these photographs there and the covers of those um, of the journals and how those archives are a part of your practice. I will start with the final part uh, uh, that uh, which was an answer of uh, from Susan which seemed brilliant to me and somehow I felt in our practice because that idea of what of what is the field in your job is um, is critically related to matter. It's something that flows very normally when you talk about archives. One of our main concerns there is that when we try to deploy a responsibility idea towards the place we are at and do it from a specific point and from that desire idea we mentioned before, trying to avoid to become an identity attitude that's not our purpose, of course, and, not, and that's not the, the, the mental space or thought we want to, to work from the culture. What we want to work on is the understanding of information that articulates our relationship with the place we are at and allow us to deploy the whole uh, response or abilities we need to, to manage within the same the same has a whole series of layers that operate that come from another uh, another level, let's say planetary or global. One of the layers that have worked uh, that has uh, over which we have worked over the last years is the archive. Desde donde nosotros miramos place from which we look at the world, the information is uh, distributed in very distant places uh, from our actual current place. So trying to recompose uh, not a real idea, but rather a series of stories that uh, leave behind, uh, um, that leave uh, or mention, forget, forget uh, displacement. That's the tissue of society but we tried not to become it, to turn it into something aggressive. That led us to to spend a lot of time in places like like this. What you can see in the larger picture is uh, is very iconic. Is how Miguel, one of the neighbors from Riaño, between 1984 and 1987, just before uh, the closer of the dam of Riaño, take a picture, took a picture of all the houses of, their of his neighbors that which will disappear a few, a, little, a, a bit of a, a time, some time later. This was. Uh, stored uh, in some facilities that were created as a compensation when that infrastructure was created. In, the, in such a um, building, there was a neighbor exercise of collecting things, of recovering things and opening it. They were very generous with us. Uh, this material within um, their scarce chances it was exposed, but somehow almost hidden, and it was a very significant information. And what we, if we join what we can see in those pictures together with what is shown in the box, in the table, there's the configuration of what uh, technicians did to expropriate to evict all those, I said, all the all the charts, all the measurements, all the taxations of all of each house, we could disassemble uh, mitigation, except that house has been conducted over this place, and which generated a, bri a giant bridge, a, a giant a giant gap among the population. To tell this story, it's quite complex. When the, the dam of Rianne was created, the people there are compensated, but since the, the, the dam takes almost 20 years to, 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 to be filled, those people still live there. So inhabitants of the dam of Porma who didn't have that chance of spending 20 more years there, in some cases they thought that they were privileged somehow, that 
they have been uh, compensated several times that somebody had become rich because of the, the from the loss of their houses. So there was a relationship of uh, broken, let's say, bad communication, misunderstandings. So this quite simple thing that means recovering those materials organizing them and relating them broke that, um, demystified de this wrong relationship of this uh, payment of those compensations. Some people felt damaged in terms of the money they perceived. Uh, there was a claim, uh, a claim that was filed, that was filed, but there was no difference in that sense between one population. Uh, there was no one le first level or second level population. It was the same case, but in that, uh, so in this uh, general overview behind this job, we can see that files actually set layers la uh, in land. Sometimes they try to tell us that those points are not connected, but our job is to just make a turn on that and find the actual connection. Yeah, no, I completely agree with the, your, your that last point in particular, Alfredo. Um, yeah, what we, this, I can talk about what we had, these images here actually, um, uh, they've been really, they've come back to me in many ways uh, precisely because of what's happening in the Ukraine right now. And these are images of the cover of Pravda and they were, I was, uh, able to have the librarians in the National Library in St. Petersburg actually help me source these, the covers of the newspapers. And what they are are the, there are 20 covers of the of Pravda from the day of the 19, April 26, 1986, to the May 15th, 20 days later when Mikhail Gorbachev finally uh, when there was finally basically made public that there was a massive and cataclysmic uh, nuclear accident at, at Chernobyl, Reactor Unit 4. Um, so in the vitrine, one sees just the, we sees the covers of the newspaper, the sort of sequential ordering of time. You know, things are happening in the world, things are happening kind of domestically but no mention of what is going on in the Ukraine. And so that sort of very long vitrine with the covers of the newspapers, that temporal dur duration in some way, and this is where I'm very, I link back to what Krista was talking about yesterday. For me, this is a kind of gap in the historical kind of timeline that the search engine has repaired. And if you put April 26, into any search engine, it will probably bring up the accident at Chernobyl. But um, when I was doing the research around Chernobyl, I was actually looking at microfiche and, and newspapers globally, because I, I was asking when did evidence of Chernobyl actually appear in public consciousness and in the public domain. And it, there is a considerable, and certainly within the former Soviet Union, there was a, a, a considerable kind of lack of public acknowledgement, even though other, as I said, other things are happening. There's an American spy satellite that is, um, sees that there's a fire at the plant. There's starting to be spikes in radioactive levels uh, throughout Scandinavia that had quite a robust sort of um, testing situation. But in some way, that this archive, um, and that experience of, of entering into the archive of analog media was a really important lesson for me because that the whole, the delay, the, I called this project delay decay, but the whole, that delay becomes in some way the space of the political. That delay from the, the event of the accident to its public acknowledgement for a whole variety of reasons which we're I'm sure all very familiar with that, that um, because I entered into that event through researching in, it, in analog form newspapers and public print media, Asvesta, Pravda, all kinds of things. The Libyan hostage crisis is happening at the same time. Lots of things are happening in the world. But 
if I had only relied on digital search tools, that kind of, um, that gap would not have disclosed itself to me. So it was a really important kind of moment in like, in my practice of not simply relying on our kind of go-to sort of, uh, sort of methods of archival kind of research. Um, and so, yeah, I think just as a kind of, pro how one enters into the archive is one question, but what kind of archives one enters into uh, can change everything, right? Um, and it's like, and also where, then of course, when we're talking about uh, material entities in the, uh, and non-traditional forms of like archives, the ways in which geological strata, et cetera, is, are also sort of archives. So these are always questions of scale, the scale at which one enters into a, a, a situation, the kinds of, um, the habits, actually I'd say the habits we develop as practitioners in, in terms of the ways in which we set up methods and work with materials. I think one always needs to constantly be challenging that the, because I think we're all, you know, humans are very habitual creatures, right? We have practices and we've developed certain kind of methodologies and really important tools for thinking and doing politics are lost if we just, can, we always proceed from a kind of habitual kind of uh, mode of operation, yeah. I think that, I think that goes and also, um, as we said before about models, when we're talking about the field work, I think that um, it's very interesting how somehow your practices, Susan, Susan's practices, are more imminent because of the concept we have of models, because of charts, of records, are also descriptive models. The uh, capacity of these abstract abstractions to simulate events or to make visible some dynamics that at first were not visible. And for me, that has something to do with the word aesthetics. Aesthetics is a word that we usually, uh, uh, you can be childish when you say this word, probably, that's something that is not uh, relevant because uh, sometimes we we have forgotten uh, the, the, the Greek root, which means feeling and give feeling, provide feeling. That's what uh, these abstractions achieve. By generating small fictions or visuals or models, they try to construct or to make visible some realities that at first are not visible. I think that your practices are uh, researches very that are very aesthetic and in that sense I would like as before that we saw some of the pictures we saw them in the cold cases project maybe it would be interesting that you develop this uh, this image and you tell us what we are seeing in this picture and also the project from Jorge Jeregui about uh, earth movings or land movings uh, related to aesthetic and how is aesthetically related to all of that I think that aesthetics are, is something very difficult to pulse because of the root that you mention, the sense that you mention. By, uh, by default, because of our studies, which were heavy in terms of Greek and classical languages, it's something that we haven't we didn't try to forget. So that way of creating sensibilities towards the world makes that aesthetics has an effect of making you feel like the host. So you can forget that you are something that is being inserted, a layer that is being inserted in other places. In our case, when well operating from the, a place like the one we have mentioned, that has been a very delicate matter because in that exercise of losing population in each of those locations, the aesthetic has meant the, the way itself of seeing the world for each of the, per, of the people there, to the persons there. So talking in those terms is not possible. If we keep ourselves within our way of seeing the world, there won't be any dialogue that will allow us to transform anything or that will allow us to, to 
see other scale of happenings. It would be very difficult to find something homogeneous in, in what we have practiced as a cultural institution in a place like, uh, like the one we have seen, because we have always run away from the idea of feeling host. We have been a long time repeating ourselves and in forums that our host is still everything that's going on, human and non-human, and we have to to let room for it. When we conduct projects like this with Jorge Jeregui, when Jorge Jeregui did this project um, and we tried to give support for the whole project, sometimes for artists it's very difficult because we cannot offer them some patterns or or, or, or defined guidelines in terms of cultural consumption by, because that's not our work environment. However, uh, conversations turn difficult when we tell them that we will be they will be operating in a sensitive layer, which uh, and that layer changes the lives of the people living there because maybe the level of distractions is is lower. There's more room for interaction to to listen. So when we formalize, uh, we when something turns into an object, into a matter, which. Um, is accountable of how we live in that land and surprisingly it still affects us and that has been very interesting to pulse this over these 15 years of work for most of us the credit of, of on what CETIX could do in terms of changing the world we live in was limited and was a result of our contact with uh, such work environment and with such thoughts. For me, the, the, the critical point, as it happened in classical speeches, uh, is based on ethics in relationship with everything around you. And works like this uh, go in the follow the same way. So it's not casual that they are corn pulp that is preceded by a photographic work of the, the, those mountains that have been re-naturalized. It's something embedded, both the idea of research and the idea of responsibility, of liability. And from there, we try to work. Um, thinking about the question of aesthetics, maybe that's operating differently in these two images. I, the image on the top, that's an image um, from the Toshiba Gamma camera. Ga Toshiba invented a portable gamma camera um, in response to the uh, accident at, in Fukushima Daiichi, because um, one of the you know, one of the provocations of radioactive contamination is always the its invisibility, and it's it's highly localized actually in terms of concentration of radioactive contaminants. So, um, he, with developing this particular camera, which have, would already have been used actually in nuclear medicine, but it, they built they developed as a field a portable field camera, so it could do large scale environmental kind of monitoring. Um, so. And we can see a bit of a kind of hot spot, which shows us the like, spikes of radioactivity, obviously in proximity to water, because uh, radionuclides move through the water system. But um, suffice to say, I'm, I find it very um, interesting that a lot of contemporary environmental monitoring, obviously satellites are a case in point, but the regime of the visual is uh, crucial to the ways in which um, we often try and, and we as in like the ways in which um, events, um, you know, planetary scale events can be um, investigated, right? But I also know that the, you know, like gas spectrometer, gas spectro I can never pronounce that word. <laughs> the spectrograms produced by gas are already also used to understand like, um, things that, to understand like uh, whatever the kind of material constitution of planets and things like that. So we, so the, the kind of realm of the, the production of visual data becomes a really important kind of um, 
uh, mechanism or tool for doing large-scale monitoring, especially of, of a sort of kind of remote events. But in, in terms of, I guess, maybe answering the question of aesthetics a bit more directly with the, um, this particular um, visualization, I, and I mentioned it a little bit, it's just to say that in working on freezing deaths uh, in Canada and the um, extreme violence that's been perpetrated against indigenous peoples in the country that I'm from over, you know, for so many decades, if not centuries, and must, much more recently, the discovery of, uh, of children who were, uh, the bodies of children who went through the residential school system. So um, the kind of, the work with forensic architecture was more than simply, this is an agency um, that, you know, have a long-term um, affiliation with, and just to say, I was, AL is the founder of Forensic Architecture, AL and I worked to develop the agency, but I would, I definitely consider AL to be the founder of the agency. Um, but just, it's not a consequence of the sort of my proximity to Forensic Architecture that uh, brought about the collaboration, but rather the fact that, of course that is that's there, but to say that the 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 specific um, the specific subject matter, which was the death of indigenous people in police custody, demanded the development of a different um, visual language in particular. And you know, you can see in my practice, I'm largely a documentarian, both when I'm working with still images or or producing kind of video images, right? So I'm not usually manufacturing images necessarily as my kind of, as the mainstay of my practice, but in this case, uh, it was absolutely clear to me that um, the necessity for trying to develop some way to account for the violence and the death and to provide a sense of also its systematic nature and to also bring temperature into the equation. So forensic architecture often will work on a timeline and the sort of, the, you know, timelines um, are really important because they allow us to play back events and slow things down and stretch them out. So a timeline as a kind of methodological um, um, tool, if we want to use that work, or, uh, or mapping things along a timeline permit, allows a whole set of like um, inquiries to take place um, in, w in of which playback is a kind of crucial and the kind of politics of playback I think would be a really interesting thing to think about as well. But, um, but then the vertical axis is sort of temperature in, in these kind of cases. Um, so just to say that I think at certain moments the condition that one is investigating or researching um, demands the development of a different um, audiovisual language, a different mode of sensibility, a different regime of representation, because there's an precisely because of the ethical demand in re, and the ethical responsibility that one has to the subjects of, in, and in this case, under no circumstances would I ever have wanted. To, there are. It, um, images in the autopsy files and the coroner's reports. And it just would have been such a violation. And, and one has to think, how does the, uh, you know, and I think this is also something that really is at the heart of journalism. When you're, when you're covering violent events, what, what are the, um, and I say this, like what are the dominant modes by which subjects of, sorry, journalistic inquiry have been represented and approached? Is it through the interview, for example? So when you're actually trying to make a work that is also a critical fraction, do you simply utilize the same strategies that have been the strategies that have already in some way, um, are they sort of like, have been the kind of prevailing ways in which someone who's been, say, is, who's been um, subject to violence or harm or trauma, do you simply use the same strategies that, say, mainstream media would use if you're an artist? Well, I'm going to interview that person too, and maybe I'll get a different kind of perspective. No, maybe an interview isn't the way to do it. Maybe an image isn't the way to proceed, even though that might be part of the sort of standard sort of approaches. So 
For me, it's about the ethical injunction of representation um, has aesthetic implications that need to be answered by the practitioner, whether they're the art, an artist or a journalist or photojournalist or filmmaker or forensic architecture investigator, yeah. In this sense, uh, every time we do like a representation, we are taking aesthetic decisions in order to sí, make those aesthetics operative, right, in the way we want. No sé, creo que estamos bastante mal. I think we are quite behind schedule. We have to wrap up, but if there's a final question, no, no. Pues bueno, pues cerramos aquí. Well. This concludes the seminar. Thank you very much, first of all, to Susan and Alfredo. Thanks to Natalia, Estrella, and Pablo. Thank you, of course, to Adam and Crystal for yesterday's session. And first and foremost, thank you, Marta, for organizing this with us. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. And remember, we're going to be holding a number of workshops next week. We there are a few spots available, so we encourage you to participate. Thank you.